Okay, welcome to Ultrasound Guided Peripheral IV Access uh, Clinical Workshop. My name is Ruben Dyshenko. Uh, I hold a bachelor's in uh, nursing science from the University of South Carolina, as well as a uh, certification in emergency nursing. I've been in uh, emergency nursing for a little over 10 years um, and previously taught this workshop uh, in conjunction with our clinical nurse specialist as part of a program for uh, competency in ultrasound guided peripheral IV access. This is kind of my talking points that I went through in the class as far as um, tips and tricks and just the various nuances of, of this kind of access. I have set this up as well, not just as source material for the end student, but also as a guide for setting up a competency program. As of the time of this recording, I'm not aware of any nationally recognized program for competency. The closest you would get to that would be um, like a PICC line program, and this is, uh, of course, not the same scope, although it is similar with the ultrasound guidance. So, uh, jumping right in uh, for an overview, uh, we're going to talk about the objectives. There's an introductory video. So this, the introductory video would typically be the part that we would cover in person. We would have ultrasound, IV gel blocks. Um, we would cover the, the actual procedure involved with demonstrations for uh, cannulating a vein. But in lieu of not having that, uh, the introductory video is a good basis for understanding the procedure. We'll talk about the equipment involved. We'll talk about the actual procedure itself. There's some special populations I'd like to cover as far as kind of the nuances to each of those. We'll talk about special supplies and then just resummarize and provide a few references. As far as objectives, we'd like you to understand the basic uh, theory and procedure behind ultrasound-guided peripheral IV access, as well as become familiar with your ultrasound device. For an actual classroom, we would try to have the device used in your area uh, here with you to get a hands-on uh, demonstration of that. Understand the basic risks of IV insertion, in particular to uh, ultrasound-guided peripheral IV insertion, and any special considerations with populations. Uh, be prepared and ready to start uh, ultrasound-guided peripheral IV attempts and then understand the next steps in your competency validation. This is the link to one of the better videos I found as far as um, a hands-on demonstration of the actual procedure, uh, better than something I could put together for this, so this will still just be the main talking points behind that. And we'll uh, go ahead and cover uh, what was discussed in the video as well. Discussing the video, um, one of the biggest advantages to ultrasound guided peripheral IV access is that uh, there are many times when you can't directly see or palpate the vein as far as a traditional IV approach. So obesity can be a big one here where there's so much uh, sub-Q tissue that you can't feel a, a good vein. IV uh, drug abuse is another thing that uh, typically a lot of the easy to reach sites have already been used uh, with scarring and uh, vein collapse. So this is particularly useful in that population to find veins that that the drug user could not have found themselves. Uh, there are some chronic health conditions. Uh, usually this is mainly when people have been subjected to multiple IV sticks or venipuncture over an extended period. So some things like this would be sickle cell, dialysis, uh, chemotherapy, and cancer patients. Typically, uh, as far as developing a program and developing a protocol for ultrasound guidance, I would say more than two to three attempts at traditional approach uh, would be the, the point to say, let's have someone with ultrasound uh, experience try this. As far as anatomy and site selection, uh, most of the time ultrasound guidance is not going to help you with uh, superficial veins where you can already see and feel those. Uh, so particularly like the hands, there's simply not, uh, not enough tissue between the vein and uh, the skin to uh, have ultrasound be beneficial in that case. Uh, in the event of IV drug abuse, uh, typically the deep veins of the upper arm um, are a great choice simply because the IV drug user uh, was enabled to feel and um, access those veins themselves. So typically those, are, those will not be scarred up and will still be viable. As pictured in the uh, picture here, the basilic vein is usually the best choice for this. Occasionally you can find that the brachial vein is uh, also a viable choice. Most of the time it is smaller and most of the time it is deeper than the basilic. And then you may also find that the cephalic is uh, approachable as well. Uh, it's been my observation that 
this tends to be kind of a genetic thing in which uh, taller people tend to have a more pronounced uh, cephalic vein and uh, shorter people may not have as pronounced or it may be very small and less, less likely to be accessed. You do need uh, longer IV catheters for this, uh, usually 1.75 to 2.5 inches. Uh, this is simply because of the depth. Anything uh, below 2 centimeters on ultrasound would not be recommended uh, for access uh, simply because you won't have enough of the catheter uh, itself in the vein. One of the best tips I could offer is to use a towel or a pillow to fully extend the arm out to the side. This provides a more flat basis for evaluation of the veins with ultrasound as far as and as well as the um, actual insertion. As far as actually assessing the veins under ultrasound, uh, assess for the directionality of the vein. Uh, make sure that you trace the vein moving the probe forward. Make sure that you know the direction that the vein is going to go. Some don't go straight up and down, but rather as a diagonal, and you need to know which way for your needle to face and which to follow. Also search for uh, scarring or narrowing of the veins. Uh, you may find Usually scarring presents as uh, an irregularity in the outside wall of the vein, so if you see a jagged or non-circular uh, border, it could be that there's scarring around that vein. You also want to assess for the, uh, the size, make sure that you, you could end up in a situation where the vein looks big but then narrows to a very small point. So make sure that you follow the full uh, length of the vein that you plan to have the catheter lie in. Veins should collapse easily under uh, ultrasound pressure. With a tourniquet or blood pressure cuff on, you want to assess to make sure that the vein collapses. If it does not collapse, then you're probably looking at an artery. Uh, you would also see throbbing of the arterial wall under ultrasound. In theory, uh, nerves would be uh, white under ultrasound, but in practicality, most of the time, all of the tissue, other than fluid-filled, uh, will look white-ish. Uh, so it's typically not easy to identify this. That being said, the most uh, risk of nerve damage would lie in accessing the brachial vein as the brachial vein, artery, and nerve all lie in the same cluster. Definitely try to avoid any tortuous veins where uh, you don't have a straight approach. Um, the catheter, when sliding off the needle, uh, is likely to kind of get jammed up against one of these um, deviations in the vein if you try to do that. It is possible to straighten it out again, but certainly not easy. As far as the supplies you'll need, you'll need an IV start kit uh, with a tegaderm, chloroprep, tourniquet, tape, and gauze. You'll need a saline flush, IV y site, or a needleless valve. You'll need IV catheters. Again, these need to be uh, longer than your traditional IV catheter. I would recommend a skin marker to mark your site. Some extra gauze, as there'll be a lot of uh, ultrasound gel to wipe off. So either just a tub of gauze or tissue paper or even washcloths would do the trick here. Ultrasound gel, um, this is typically clean, but it's not sterile. Uh, you'll need KY jelly in the sterile packs to do your actual uh, insertion. Lidocaine or a topical anesthetic, and we'll talk about that on the next slide, as well as a pillow or rolled up sheet or blanket. As far as using lidocaine, while unlikely, you do want to assess for any allergy to lidocaine. In over 300 insertions, I've only encountered one person that said they had a lidocaine allergy, uh, but you do want to assess for that before you uh, start. 1 ml or 0.5 to 1 ml is typically the amount you'd need for this. Uh, it is a little bit more than what is typically used for a peripheral IV insertion. That's simply because this is deeper and it's a more prolonged procedure. I do highly recommend using lidocaine during this because of the depth and because of the amount of uh, maneuvering necessary and the time involved in uh, guiding your needle in. This makes both the patient and the inserter uh, a whole lot more comfortable. It's, it's a whole lot more comfortable, especially for those that are new at this, um, if they don't have the patient in pain while they're trying to maneuver the needle. There are some other options that you can use. There's a topical uh, pain spray called Pain Ease, which is a uh, cold-based uh, spray. There are, uh, you can use LET or IMLA, which are both topical lidocaine-based uh, numbing agents. Because of the depth involved, I do prefer the uh, injectable lidocaine, as I believe this provides better penetration and uh, better coverage for the depth of the needle. Uh, be aware that there are multi-use and single-dose uh, vials of lidocaine. Know which one that you've used. Make sure that you time and date it uh, if it's a multi-use vial. 
uh, advise the patient that lidocaine will also typically burn slightly. Uh, this is due to the preservative in the vial, as most, uh, most vialed solutions are acidic by nature to prevent bacterial growth. Typically a 30 gauge, uh, one half inch TB syringe is uh, appropriate to this. If you don't have access to that, a 30 gauge needle on a, any type of syringe uh, would be adequate. Uh, follow the lidocaine needle uh, stick point once you've uh, inserted. Typically this will leave a little prick of blood behind and that'll typically be where you want to guide your needle to afterwards. The injection, uh, once you've injected the small amount of lidocaine, you may see this on ultrasound as a spreading black layer, usually irregular, uh, right above your vein. You do want to make sure on insertion too that you aspirate back and make sure that you're not in the venous structure. Uh, as you would not want to inject lidocaine systemically. There is no increased risk with ultrasound guided uh, peripheral IV access than traditional IV approach. So the risk for this would be the same as for any uh, IV access attempt. Phlebitis is one uh, issue which can either happen from contamination of the site resulting in a uh, infection or bacterial um, phlebitis or you could as well have a mechanical phlebitis where the um, like the movement in a particular area such as the antecubital fossa uh, is in a highly mechanical area and, and would result in uh, moving of the catheter sheath along the vein causing irritation. Again this would be the same whether a traditional IV approach or with ultrasound. As far as infection goes, the uh, prevention for this would be the same as with any IV, is that you want to provide proper uh, hand hygiene and proper um, sterilization of the site using either alcohol or chloroprep as your uh, protocol dictates. Infiltration, extravasation, uh, this may be a high risk as far as ultrasound goes. It's not a risk to the insertion itself, but because of the depth uh, that most ultrasound placed IVs lie, um, there is risk that it could shear out of the vein. Um, that's typically why you want to make sure that you have a long length of your catheter left uh, in the vein after you've inserted. You also don't want to place in areas that would be high risk of um, infiltration, which can be the upper arm if there's a lot of sub-Q tissue in that area. We'll talk about that more later. As with any IV attempt, it is possible to cannulate an artery versus a vein. Uh, in theory, the ultrasound should make this more obvious and prevent this by actual visualization of the venous and arterial structures. It is possible to injure a nerve. Um, as we discussed before, it's not uh, incredibly easy to find these nerves on ultrasound, but the risk is the same for a blind approach where you could damage the nerve as well. A linear probe is used for this uh, ultrasound guidance. Uh, it should be uh, small and rectangular based. Um, know that there is a directionality to the probe. Typically there's a dot or a raised area on one edge of the probe that corresponds to a dot on the screen. If you have this in reverse, it'll be like using a joystick or a mouse in a reverse position, so make sure that you have the directionality right. This is an extremely ambidextrous skill. Uh, you need to be ready to move the probe and the needle in concert together. The transverse approach will give you a cross-section of the vein that's typically used for your insertion as you walk your needle into the vein. The longitudinal approach will show you the length of the vein and after your insertion can show you the length of catheter left in the vein itself. Keep in mind that to do this you are lining up three very thin um, planes, the ultrasound plane itself, the needle, and the part of the vein that you're in. It's like aligning three different pieces of, of paper width uh, in the same view. So this can be rather difficult. Uh, it's typically used more to confirm your catheter placement at the end of the procedure than to guide at this, at this juncture. You can use a guideline, which is my preference, if that's available on your uh, device. Um, for me, it just helps keep things centered um, and lets you make constant adjustments to your probe to keep the, the center of your view in place. Your gain can be adjusted, but keep in mind this is typically brightness without uh, adjusting contrast. So at some point you will wash out your, your image if you go too bright. Magnification can also be adjusted, but in most cases uh, this doesn't increase the resolution. So keep in mind that uh, while you will zoom in, that you lose somewhat of the uh, resolution as you go there. Where most people have trouble while they're learning this technique is right at the beginning of insertion. They tend to lose their 
their needle point after they've gotten under the skin. One thing to keep in mind is that because the plane of view for the probe lies in the very middle of the probe, it takes a few uh, millimeters to get under that plane. So people get lost in those first few millimeters and don't know where their, their needle point is. The best you can do is make sure that you're still um, holding your needle perpendicular to the probe and that you're still going in the, uh, the direct spot that you aimed for. Tilting can help, or fanning, which is kind of moving the probe, um, keeping it perpendicular to the skin, but moving the probe uh, backwards or forwards over that point. Um, this can kind of look back towards where your insertion point is, or look forward, depending on which way you fan. Don't expect to be able to visualize your needle point uh, prior to vein penetration. As we talked about before, most of the uh, subcutaneous structures will appear white, and occasionally the needle point itself tends to get kind of lost in that. The best you can do is jiggle uh, your needle to try to find your place, or you can, uh, you'll see the tinting above the vein as you get close to penetration. For deep veins, you want to use a steep angle to preserve as much of the catheter as, as possible for actual vein um, cannulation. For superficial veins, you may have to be uh, almost uh, parallel with the skin when you insert. Insert until you see the white dot in the middle of your black circle. Um, you will want to uh, center that dot as best as possible in the middle of, of your black circle of the vein. Then you move your probe forward until the dot disappears. You would then push your needle in further and see the white dot again. Each time you would center this in the vein, this is called walking your needle forward. Especially if you're new and if you have trouble uh, losing your needle during your insertion, keep in mind how much of the length of the needle you have in the uh, tissue. Have an idea for where your midpoint of the needle is physically and then that'll help you judge uh, how far into the tissue you are. And also your angle would give you a um, trajectory for that needle. Don't, uh, it's very hard for experienced practitioners with traditional IVs, but don't look for uh, the flash in the, uh, the needle chamber. It's easy to get flash and either be through the back side of the vein or have nicked it. Uh, any number of things can give you a flash without proper, proper placement. So the best thing is visualizing you're walking the needle into the vein and then visualizing it in the longitudinal approach as well to confirm your placement. You will have flash, but don't look for that as your confirmation. You should still feel the, uh, the kind of pop of the vein that you're used to in a traditional approach. As you penetrate the vein, there will be that resistance and suddenly it's gone as you insert. Once you have uh, the catheter fully off the needle, then you do want to use the tr uh, longitudinal approach to um, assess for your structures and make sure that you are completely in the vein for the catheter. You can use the longitudinal approach if for some reason you uh, were to get stuck uh, back to the torturous veins problem. If the catheter gets jammed in a bend of a vein, you can um, realign and then move forward, but you may have to look at it in this longitudinal axis uh, versus the transverse. You do want to know your devices in your location uh, and how to use them. Uh, typical functions are where your power is, your magnification, your uh, guideline, your brightness, your contrast, things like that. Different devices do have different um, resolution and uh, quality, uh, but you have to be familiar with what's available in your area. As far as procedure and protocol for this, this is just a, a generalization and recommended as a starting point. Each facility and organization will have to develop their own. But as a general guideline, uh, you would have to verify your order for a peripheral IV, check for allergies, both the cleaning agent and the topical if used, gather your appropriate supplies and equipment, wash your hands and don gloves, identify your patient and explain the procedure, position the target extremity and apply a tourniquet, examine your vascular structures using a clean uh, sonic conductive gel and uh, select the appropriate area. Mark your target site uh, and remove the clean gel from the site. Cleanse your area according to policy uh, without subsequent contamination as well as cleaning the ultrasound probe head. Place anesthetic appropriately without site contamination. Apply sterile gel uh, to the target site after your uh, cleaning agent dries. You would want to re-verify your target uh, venous structure using the sterile technique with ultrasound probe. Penetrate your skin with a needle at an angle appropriate to the depth and advance in uh, proper trajectory towards the venous structure. 
Penetrate a venous structure and use walking forward approach to ensure proper catheter placement. Only thread off uh, once you have repeated this several times. Verify your uh, needle blood flush and remove your tourniquet. Remove your needle and apply a valve or IV tubing as appropriate. Uh, draw your blood specimens if applicable and per policy. Attach your IV uh, saline flush and ensure proper blood return. Then flush the valve and tubing. Assess for pain and swelling during this as well. Apply appropriate dressing, tape, and label according to policy. You want to uh, remove and discard supplies and trash, uh, place any sharps in the appropriate containers, remove your gloves and wash your hands, educate the patient on IV care and signs and symptoms of infiltration, assess patient is, uh, assure the patient is comfortable and safe as per policy, and then document according to your policy. When we developed our competency program, uh, this was kind of the core philosophy we followed, and that's that ultrasound guided peripheral IV access doesn't re represent any additional risk versus the traditional approach. Because of this, this doesn't uh, this is not a high risk procedure that would necess necessitate a strenuous competency. Our typical recommendations were five successfully documented uh, attempts at ultrasound uh, IV access. For competency, a computer-based training module can also be built uh, with video and material as appropriate. Um, if possible, a simulated first attempt hands-on uh, in a workshop would be recommended. Uh, this would be the first uh, successful attempt, um, but would be simulated traditionally on a vein block or something of that nature. In an ideal world, uh, all five attempts would be uh, supervised, but Traditionally, with beginning a program like this, uh, sufficient trainers are not available to uh, do this. And uh, on top of that, it typically takes 20 to 30 minutes uh, at the bedside, and it's simply not practical for there to be uh, multiple staff using that type of time. Uh, physicians could also uh, help with assisting and supervising. But traditionally, what we would have the uh, first attempt simulated, second attempt closely uh, guided. And then we would simply ask uh, another clinician to verify the line. And then by verify the line, what I would mean is that the uh, line still withdraws blood after insertion, that it flushes well without pain or redness to the site. Um, and it could also be uh, re-visualized under a tegaderm with ultrasound gel to see the catheter placement as verification. For those monitoring your competency, uh, if you're using the uh, EPIC uh, electronic health record uh, or probably other similar EMRs, um, Reports can be built based on your charting of your IVs if you include an option for ultrasound placement, usually a simple yes or a check button would do. You can base reports on that and evaluate your staff um, as far as how many attempts they have. This is just to reiterate the risks that we've already covered as far as um, there are no additional risks outside of or in addition to the uh, traditional approach uh, with ultrasound. If anything, the increased visualization of the actual structure should be lower risk. As an example, I've included here the uh, protocol and procedure as far as a competency checklist. Uh, this is just an idea as to where to start um, and would allow you to provide documentation of the competency. Next, we'll talk about a few special populations and special considerations which you might want to uh, have in mind as you look at these folks. As with all invasive procedures for pediatrics, um, the key is really finding the person that can hold them the best uh, to prevent any movement. Um, with pediatrics, whether you're doing a traditional approach or, or ultrasound, uh, most of the time it's better to simply aim at getting under the skin at first. They typically move the most during the first uh, point of penetration, and once you're under the skin, uh, then you can go towards your vein. If you try to hit the vein directly, you may find that you'll uh, blow the vein or rupture it due to the movement when they first get uh, poked. Generally speaking, uh, pediatrics under three um, will be very difficult for this unless they're already sedated in some way. Um, just due to the small nature of the structures and due to the fact that they can't uh, control their um, anxiety during the procedure, uh, the amount of movement is going to um, make this very difficult. Neonates especially um, in infants, uh, with everything being so small, any movement at all, any shudder is going to throw off your approach and make it very difficult to cannulate a vein. 
anesthetic uh, would be advised, but keep in mind that especially with uh, younger pediatrics that uh, it's mostly just the trauma and the anxiety of the procedure itself. So whether you use anesthetic or not, uh, it typically is not going to be beneficial. Um, but it could, as with most things with pediatrics, it may be more of a benefit for the parent to let them know that you're doing something for the pain of the procedure than for the actual child. As a special population, those with prominent vasculature uh, can have some special um, thoughts around that. Uh, especially when you're starting out, it would be best to uh, utilize ultrasound on people that are not difficult, on people that have uh, good veins and would, would be fine under a traditional approach. Um, but that way you're not trying on someone that's already difficult. So these people are a great example of that. The things to consider though is that keep in mind, and you'll see this under ultrasound, is that typically those veins are only a, a paper's width below the, the skin. So if you use any sort of angle at all, uh, you'll go through the back wall of the vein. For these folks, uh, you essentially need to be parallel with the arm, the skin, and then very, very small angle, uh, if any at all. Keep in mind, too, that when veins are this prominent, um, you'll need a lot of gel because any pressure uh, of the weight of the probe is going to collapse that vein. You may find, too, that with, uh, in the case of bodybuilders or strength trainers, that there's a great deal of elasticity with the vein, which may mean that it just has a tougher uh, endothelium to get through uh, for your actual puncture of the vein. As another special population, you may run into veins that are simply tough, and this can happen from any number of reasons. It could be from IV drug use, uh, or it could be from uh, trauma or scarring from other things such as burns or, uh, or cuts. Um, it could simply happen because uh, they have a high atherosclerosis um, level in those veins, causing a great deal of plaque on the inside. You may find this especially in... Um, the African-American elderly population uh, as they may have very tough veins that can be palpated uh, but may feel like a tendon or a, or a rope rather than um, soft and, uh, and able to be penetrated well. In these situations where you can already see and feel the vein but it's tough, ultrasound won't help you anymore uh, in actually penetrating this vein. You may find too that uh, in the situation of tough veins, you may find that a larger needle will actually be uh, more appropriate um, and more beneficial towards actually penetrating the vein. You could find that uh, tough skin is a problem as well. Some people have very leathery skin that's difficult to get under. Um, I would recommend, as with the pediatrics, that the goal be to simply get under the skin first and then go towards the vein after that. Also, in the case of uh, tough veins, you may find that uh, during your penetration, while you're watching your white dot go into the black circle of your vein, you're still feeling resistance when you think it is in the vein. Occasionally it drags the upper wall of the vein and doesn't fully uh, penetrate the endothelium. Um, this is why you want to walk that needle into the vein several times before you um, try to slide your catheter off. If you've only nicked the top wall of the vein and you try to slide a catheter off, uh, it'll either infiltrate or it'll bounce off um, that nick in the vein and you won't actually get into the vein itself. Another population to consider would be those with uh, loose subcutaneous tissue. Uh, this can either happen in the elderly or um, with folks that have had gastric bypass and lost a lot of weight. Uh, what happens is there's not as much uh, subcut tissue or in the elderly it's a lack of collagen in the subcut tissue to anchor the veins anymore so you'll find that uh, rolling veins are more of a problem in this group. You also want to be aware uh, how much of that loose uh, subcut tissue you have, so the upper arms will not be the best uh, situations in this. It's very easy with that much loose subcut tissue for the uh, IV anchor point to shear away from what catheter is actually left in the vein. For these folks, uh, it's highly recommended instead of using the upper arms or areas with a lot of that loose tissue to use either the AC or to use uh, the forearm as best as possible. Anorexia or uh, low body weight can be another issue. Uh, with these folks you may find that while you can see and palpate veins that they either have uh, very little turgor pressure to them um, or they're very small just in general. I found with this that uh, it can 
be more beneficial instead of a traditional tourniquet to use a um, blood pressure cuff that provides more even compressive pressure. This can also work better with folks with uh, low blood pressure. Something I've witnessed several times is uh, you evaluate a vein, it looks large enough for insertion, and then you either uh, inject your lidocaine or you actually insert your needle, and then the vein seems a whole lot smaller uh, than where you previously evaluated it. This seems to happen the most in people with autoimmune or inflammatory diseases. They seem to have kind of a systemic response uh, to the pain of the needle stick, and sometimes you'll see that vein constrict. A lot of times when people say my veins hide, this is uh, one of the things that can cause this to happen. Uh, my best uh, advice is to simply give it a few seconds, uh, allow it to um, allow the tissues to relax, allow the vasoconstriction to stop. Um, while you have your tourniquet on and you're, you're watching it, evaluating it, you could have them pump their fists several times to try to uh, re-engage the vein. So, in terms of summary, just know that this takes time. Uh, it is difficult, it's a learned skill, but uh, you have to be patient, don't give up. Again, look with ultrasound and try on the patients that aren't difficult. Know that um, when you get called and on patients that's difficult and you've missed the vein, know that they were already difficult from the onset. You weren't called on someone that was easy. Um, so just because you have the ultrasound doesn't make it a 100% sure shot. Make sure that you fully extend the arm. Use a pillow or a um, rolled up blanket under that. It'll definitely give you better control over the extremity you're trying to uh, put IV in. Use a lidocaine. Uh, it'll make both you and the patient more comfortable, especially while you're learning. Uh, it'll make it easier on you both and give you more confidence in your procedure. Remember that it's easiest to lose your place during the first point of insertion and that it takes a few millimeters to get under the plane of the uh, probe head. Just know that. Know how to uh, jiggle intent in order to find your point um, and keep uh, be persistent. Make sure you go steep. Unless something is very superficial, you will need the best uh, depth that you can uh, to preserve the amount of catheter that you have in the vein. Make sure you avoid uh, insertions in loose sub-Q tissue, uh, especially with the elderly or the obese, as these, these can often infiltrate due to, due to a shearing action. Avoid veins over 1.5 centimeters unless you have access to longer uh, IV catheters. These can often uh, infiltrate simply because there's not enough uh, catheter length still left in the vein. Use a skin marker to mark your location uh, after you're looking with clean gel, but be sure to use uh, chloroprep on both the site and the probe head uh, and use sterile KY jelly before actually inserting. So particularly when you're drawing blood cultures off this, uh, this location, you need to watch your technique and make sure that you follow the proper technique for drawing blood cultures in a sterile situation. Be aware of the cleaning protocol for your ultrasound equipment, specifically the probe heads. This has a very uh, sensitive rubber top to it. Peroxide or bleach based cleaners uh, typically have a damaging effect on these probe heads. Remember that you might not be able to see your needle tip uh, prior to insertion of the vein as most, uh, most sub-Q tissues look white in appearance. Keep the amount of probe compression on the underlying tissue in mind. Uh, realize that when you take the probe in your hand off that that tissue is going to expand. Um, as best as you can you need to uh, hover the probe in the gel and see the actual depth of the vein because that tissue will um, elongate once you're done with the pressure of your probe. Also keep the, keep the length of your needle in mind. Uh, if you lose your place, uh, kind of know your halfway point of the needle and this will help you kind of judge where you're at uh, in the tissue. As far as setting up your uh, program, these are some supplies I recommend. Uh, BD makes a Insight Auto Guard. I believe this is the auto retracting version here. Uh, it comes uh, 20 gauge by uh, 1.88, which is one of the longer you can get. Braun makes an even longer one, which is 18 at 2.5, which I believe is the longest you can get. Once you get to three inches, you're in midline cath territory, and that's a different, different discussion. Um, I've also included here a link to the uh, block for, um, it's a vein training block as far as uh, supervising insertions. Guys, I appreciate it. Thank you for uh, stopping in to uh, check out this um, presentation. I hope this was helpful for you. Um, there's a lot of things I've just found experientially that I, I think is valuable to share, um, and I wish you the best of luck. 
Uh, if I can be of any help, uh, please let me know. Um, and uh, good IV starts. Thanks.